with the Trinity, this is the most complex thing in the world. There are trillions of creatures, only single-celled amoeba-like creatures. But then you have human beings, and they say we have between 80 trillion and 300 trillion cells. And above us are the angels, and there's God. So, you know, there's a ascending scale of complexity from the amoeba going up to God. When someone said to, I think it was Benjamin Franklin, I can't understand the Trinity, he said, why do you think you should be able to understand the arithmetic of heaven? God is one person in himself and three persons to himself. As seen and known, God is three. As seeing and knowing, God is one. There are three personal distinctions in the divine essence, but wherever one member of the Trinity is, the others are always there, but one's in the vanguard. So it wasn't the Holy Spirit that was crucified. It wasn't the Father that was crucified. But the Bible says, through the eternal Spirit, he offered himself. And it says, God was in Christ. So please remember, as seen and known, the Trinity is three. As seeing and knowing, the Trinity is one. One essence with three distinct but not separate manifestations. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The word person, when used in early theology, did not have quite the same meaning we give it. It was often used for a persona, a mask that was put on players, actors. So the members of the Trinity are distinct but not separate. And this is a great rule in all theology. There are many things in theology that are distinct but must never be separated. For example, and this shouldn't surprise us, it's the same in human life. Husband and wife are distinct but shouldn't be separated. They're one, but they shouldn't quarrel about which one. They're distinct. They're distinct, but not separate, see? Now, in theology, we have justification, which means being acquitted. And then we have sanctification. Well, justification means declaring right. Sanctification means making right. Declaring righteous, justification. Making righteous, sanctification. They are distinct. Why are they distinct? Because the moment you accept the love of the Son of God, doesn't matter what your background is, ecclesiastical or behaviour-wise, you are counted 100% righteous for all your days that you're trusting in Him. You are counted 100% right. Even when you blow it again and again and again and again, when you fail again and again and again, you are still counted 100% righteous, as though you'd never sinned. It's more than forgiveness. Justification more than forgiveness. It means I'm going to treat you as though you'd never sinned. And he does it even after I've sinned. Now, that doesn't mean I have a license to sin. You remember the famous saying of Oscar Wilde, God loves to forgive sin, I love to sin, a wonderful combination. No, no, he didn't have it right. After God declares us righteous, he imparts the Holy Spirit, he comes to dwell in us, we're no longer alone. And he begins to make us righteous. But it's a lifetime process. As a matter of fact, you will feel worse after you've been a Christian for 10 years than before you were one. And worse again after 30, or in my case, after 50, over 50. You know, I'm far, far more aware of how far short I fall in a thousand areas now than I would ever have dreamt of when I became a Christian. So justification being declared righteous, 100%. That's how God deals with us. Doesn't see in us the likeness of the sinner. Only sees in us the likeness of his son. And you've got that in a moment. In a moment. In a moment you have eternal life. In a moment you have the verdict of the last judgment. That's a wonderful teaching of scripture. You don't have to wait to judgment day. Am I going to make it? As soon as you accept Christ, provided you keep hold of him, don't leave him, despite all your stumbling, all your failure, you lose lots of battles, you'll never lose the war. So that's justification, being declared righteous, given the verdict, the last judgment, the moment you believe, 
given eternal life the moment you believe, given the indwelling Holy Spirit the moment you believe, and he will never leave you. I'll give you the comforter that he may abide with you forever. He never leaves you, even when you make hundreds of mistakes. But that's distinct from sanctification because sanctification is never 100%. See? My ratio in many of the Christian virtues is about 5 out of 100. Sanctification is a lifetime process. See? So justification and sanctification are distinct, otherwise I'll never be at peace. I see how impatient I am and uh, angry I am and proud I am and intemperate I am and I'll say, oh, what's the use of my being a Christian? But then I remember justification is distinct and is 100%. But sanctification must never be separated, but it must be distinguished because it's not 100%. So you never look at yourself. If you want an answer to the question, how am I doing? The answer is so terrible you won't want to hear it. <laughs> See? That's the truth. So, in the Trinity, the members of the Trinity are distinct. The Father's not the Spirit, the Spirit's not the Son. They're distinct, but they're not separate. Justification and sanctification, distinct, but not separate. And there are many examples like this uh, in theology, and we'll come across some as we go on. So, we've talked about theology, Christology, pneumatology, uh, anthropology, the nature, doctrine of man. And uh, there are some thorny things in the doctrine of man. It has been traditional to teach that man is not only body and not only does he have spiritual capacities but that he has something ethereal called the soul. Now Bible scholars are looking again at anthropology say is that exactly what the Old New Testament teaches and many say yes it is. Some others say no it may not be. But we're not going to get into that much too much now. But anthropology is the nature of man. It includes the fact that he's a sinner. And therefore, trust but verify. Trust but verify. Every corporate group, remember, society is just a group of incurables until glorification at the coming of Christ. Okay, that's anthropology. Then we talked about soteriology and I alluded to that briefly. Whether you're Roman Catholic or Protestant, the answer is you're saved by grace. In other words, God says, come and welcome. Whosoever will may come. He that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast out. And that doesn't matter whether you're Nicodemus or Mary Magdalene, Joseph Arimathea, uh, Doubting Thomas, slow to believe Philip, you know, doesn't matter who. Grace accepts them all. This is where the study of faith comes in because faith has no virtue in itself. A lot of people say, I wish I had more faith. They misunderstand. Faith is a looking off to the faithful one. Faith is not a struggling to have more in myself. It is the habit of looking to him. So instead of my saying, oh, I'm so impatient, unkind, I must look off to the patient one. I must look off to the kind one. That's the only way I will be changed. Ten looks at the physician for every look at the wound. See? So we've talked a little about uh, anthropology and soteriology. We've introduced the topic of faith. Faith is the empty hand that takes the gift as we look in the face of Jesus. The greatest invitation is John 3.16, whosoever believeth may have everlasting life. Not perish, not perish. So that's soteriology. How is it done? Grace, gift by faith. The small boy looking at the party table, give me a knife and a fork and a chance. That's faith. Take it, take it. Right. Then uh, after soteriology, We mentioned ecclesiology, that's the doctrine of the church. And it's important to make the distinction we made earlier. There is a difference between the church invisible, which is composed of all the twice born, and only God and the angels know who. We may guess when we see how people live. If this church elder is always uh, giving me short measure at his store, I have my doubts he's in the church invisible. Because you shall know them by their fruits. 
You're not to judge people's motives, you are commanded to judge their fruits. So ecclesiology is the doctrine of the church. Upon this rock I'll build my church. The church is declared to be in the New Testament one. Christ has one bride. And by that is meant all who are born again. All who are born again are members of the church. Whatever their name or sign. Then finally eschatology. <coughs> eschatology falls into two areas. Individual eschatology, what happens at death, doctrine of the judgment, doctrine of the resurrection, and then in a universal sense, a new heavens and a new earth and the events leading up to it. That's where we will try to focus most. What does biblical apocalyptic say about the events that will mark the last days? And here I will depart very widely from popular presentations like Hal Lindsay's Late Great Planet Earth. That book made a fortune for its writer. It was a uh, turning into some sort of prose of notes that had been taken at Dallas Theological Seminary. But it's not a book that can be endorsed by any well-known scholar in the field of eschatology. We will try to get what the Bible's really trying to say, and I think you will see it. Truth is self authenticating. Many things you see, you see. You don't have to be told that torturing children is wrong. You see it. And truth stands out. And as we study eschatology from the biblical apocalyptic, I think you will feel, as I have felt for decades, that the real truth on this stands out. And what I'm going to say is not going to be peculiar to me or it'll be worth nothing. What I will be saying is a consensus of where the best scholars in eschatology are in this year of grace 2002. I've written several books on it. Um, one you won't find in any bookshop because it's now out of print. This is one I did at Manchester University, The Abomination of Desolation and Biblical Eschatology. And just to whet your appetite a little, I will remind you that Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now here's something strange. There are literally miles of books about what Jesus said on the parables. There are miles of books on what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. There are miles of books on the cross and the resurrection. When for two years, for about 18 hours a day, seven days a week, even in church I was singing on it, I hunted to see what's the result of Jesus telling people to understand the abomination of death. I couldn't find one book. Now isn't that amazing? Jesus puts his finger on a prophecy and says, make sure you understand it. And I couldn't find one book. And you won't find one either. Even though this is now 20 years since I wrote this, you won't find one either. See, But we will study this theme. But I repeat again that what I will be saying in essence, it was just peculiar to me, not worth a cracker. But I've had the privilege of studying the best work done by scholars in biblical apocalyptic for 2,000 years. We have the cream of it available and the essence of that I will try to convey to you. Right, we've talked about seven divisions. Can I go on to finish the topic I uh, moved into is why we believe the Bible. I'm only doing, dealing with one area of evidence because of what it says about Christ and from Christ. Christ is the main reason for believing the Bible. Christ. We talked a little bit about his claims, authority in heaven and earth, owns the angels, ruler of nature, everybody ought to love him more than their own lives, forgives sins, judge of all the world, existed from eternity. We've, we've looked at those claims. I'm the light of the world. What a, what a mouthful. Now I want to remind you of some of the prophecies. Here is the quickest way 
to help a person that really wants to know whether the Bible's true. Here's the quickest way. Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. When I was preparing to come over here from the States, I had about 10,000 books. I couldn't pack them all, got rid of a lot of them. But there were books there from most of the centuries. I had books from most of the great known writers and about the great people. I've got shells of history and shells of biography, about 300 books on biography and so on. There's not another person in the world who's ever lived that made a forecast like that which has come true. When I was in Russia, I can remember I'd been an old folks home and behind me would be a portrait of Lenin. I'd be coming home from meetings at 2 o'clock in the morning and I'd, I'd be saying, oh, we're home. And then I found out they had a statue of Lenin in every city. I wasn't home, see. Now, if Lenin had said, heaven and earth will pass away, but not my brand of communism, not what I've said, 70 years and it's gone, you know. They're the only people holding on to communism now are people in universities who haven't had much practical training in, uh, in politics. How did Christ know that his verity, his truth, would never be submerged by another? How did he know? Philosophies have come and gone. Just as theories in science and theology have come and gone. How did he know that his particular teaching was going to survive all the others that would cluster in, pile up, pyramids high? His would go through until the end of time. His word would be known and echoed and taught and believed. So I'm suggesting to you the evidence can be summarized in five minutes that Christ held the whole of the future in his hand. Now, Nostradamus, dear friends, has a nose of wax. You can twist Nostradamus any way you like. Mother Shipton's prophecies were written by a man called Charles Hindley, a hundred years after Mother Shipton was supposed to have written them. If real prediction was possible, there'd never be horse racing. You can guess... You can't predict with unerring accuracy. But Christ did. On another occasion he said, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all unto me. Well, so far he's drawn in our present world about two billion. Judgment Day will complete it. But who else has drawn billions? And he's drawn them from every country. You know, if you're in Africa, the Africans think Christ was black. If you talk to Red Indians, they think he was red. The people in Europe think he's like them, you know. Actually, he wasn't like any of these. The, uh, not quite like. But the fact is, people of every colour, every nation, every realm of society, don't ever think Christianity is only for the people without education. Some of the cleverest people who've ever lived were Christians, like Blaise Pascal and many, many others. So he has drawn them under him. And take this one. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. Now it's in the context of when there's a generation with worldwide war, increasing earthquakes, increasing famines and society becoming as rotten as a polluted carcass do you remember the verse that says where the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together? That's in Matthew 24. Christ is picturing things at the end of the world and he says in that generation where war is global, there have always been wars, earthquakes, widespread, there have always been earthquakes, famines, society be as rotten as it can be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Then he says the gospel will go to all the world in that generation. Yet to be fulfilled in Pentecostal power. But we do have the mediums now to do it. 
every part of the world now can. While I was in America, I was speaking on, on radio and it could be picked up pretty well anywhere in North America. Canada and US. You know, that's amazing. Some little guy sitting in a studio in a building nobody knows anything about and it can go out over all of North America. So we have the means now to do it, see. So there's another one of his predictions. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world for witness. Then shall the end come. Here's a very important one. Let me read you the exact words. This is from Luke 21, which is part of the Olivet Sermon. And this is well worthy of our thought. I'm reading from verse 24. They will fall by the edge of the sword, be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles till the times the Gentiles are fulfilled. So here Christ is saying, the beginning of the chapter, they're showing him the beautiful temple. He says the temple's going to be destroyed. And they say, well, what are these things? And he tells them things that apply before the destruction of the temple in AD 70 that happen again on a global scale at the end of time. And when he's talking about the destruction of the temple, he says, and this Jewish nation, God's chosen people, you know the saying, how odd of God to choose the Jews, but they represent all of us. It's not really odd. The Jewish heart's no different than the Gentile heart. The Bible is not anti-Semitic in either testament. But here Christ is saying, when this city is destroyed, the Jewish race will be scattered among all nations. That's quite a prediction. But don't miss the next bit. And you'll have a question on the next bit. It says, And Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles till the times the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, how Lindsay said, that means until 1948, when the Jews went back. Oh no, Mr. Lindsay. In the New Testament, only believers are counted as Israel in this dispensation. Romans 2.28. He's not a Jew which is one outwardly. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, whose circumcision is of the heart, not of the flesh. Now, of course, that can happen to a Jew also. More Jews have been converted to Christ in the last 15 years and the previous 15 centuries. That's a wonderful thing. But when it says Jerusalem be trodden down to the Gentiles, the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled, what Christ is saying is it will never be the centre of God's true people again. And most of the Israelites in Jerusalem now are atheists. You know that, don't you? Only about 10% of Jews are believers, what you call orthodox. Only about 10%. The vast majority of Jews throughout the world are agnostics or atheists, but culturally Jewish. And then there's a small proportion that are devoutly Jewish, that believe in the inspiration of the Old Testament and the miracles of the Old Testament. But they're a minority. So Christ's prediction was this. This great city, which has been God's city, the holy city, not going to be that ever again. And when you remember that the New Testament says the only real Jews now in God's sight are those who are believers, members of the covenant, whose circumcision is of the heart, not of the flesh. He's not a Jew which is one outwardly. You know, it's got warnings in the last book of the Bible. Beware of those who say they are Jews and are not. Very important. We'll, we'll read those later. Right. So here's Christ saying, look, this city is never again going to be the holy city. It's going to be an unholy city until the end of time. I don't think it's any more unholy than Sydney or New York or LA. But the point is Christ is saying never again will have its former glory where God chose to manifest himself in special ways. And you think of it. All these centuries... Mohammedans, Turks, British, all sorts of people have owned it. In 48, those who were Jews according to the flesh came back in small numbers. Only about a 10% of the Jewish race went over there. Now there's more. But what a prediction to make. It's as though you and I stood up in Canberra and said this city is going to be taken and never again will it be what it has been in our day, never again. 
After his resurrection, Christ gave predictions. He said, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be witnesses unto me in Judea and Samaria and the othermost parts of the world. That's after his resurrection, a prediction. So my suggestion is, if a person really wants to know whether the Bible is true, invite them to consider some of the predictions of Christ, which is, can be read in a few minutes. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My word shall never pass away. This city is going to lose its statue of a holy city for the rest of time. And I, if I be lifted up, there'll be multitudes drawn to me. The gospel's going to go in a last generation. How could that be? They had no books, no television, no radio. But he said the time will come and it'll go to the ends of the earth. How did he know? See, So these predictions are helpful. I have time to cover one more area, I think, at least in part. Not only does the New Testament testify to Christ, but the Old does. And a very important point is this. There is no prophecy selected by Roman Catholic or Protestant scholars from the Old Testament to apply to Jesus, which Jews themselves did not apply to the Messiah long before his birth. I must say that again. It's very important. There's no Old Testament passage which Christians now use as being a prediction of Christ, which Jews themselves did not apply to the coming Messiah centuries before he came. For example, look at one in Genesis 49.10. This is a good one to consider. 49.10 of Genesis. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, till Shiloh comes, he to whom it belongs, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. The scepter won't depart from Judah till Shiloh comes. Shiloh is a mysterious word. It's a bit like Jehovah. We think that Jehovah means the ever-living one but it does have linguistic problems. This word, most interpreters think it means the peace giver. Shiloh, the peace giver. But it has linguistic difficulties. But what's clear is some great one is coming who ultimately will gather all the people and until he comes, Judah will be preeminent among the tribes of Israel. Now, you'll remember that 10 of the tribes of Israel were pretty much wiped out about 722 BC. And that left Judah and Benjamin, the other two tribes, though some came out of those missing, captured 10 and joined with Judah and Benjamin. But Judah remained preeminent. And in the days of Christ, the leaders of the people were the prominent leaders from among Judah. Most of the people at Jerusalem came from the tribe of Judah. And Christ is of that background himself by his genealogy, as Matthew and Luke make clear. So once he came, Judah remains forever, forever. Because the true Jewish king, Shiloh, has come. And under him shall the gathering of the people be. That's quite a statement. Look with me at the most well-known passage in the Bible predicting Christ. Isaiah 52, the last verses, and then 53. This is worth looking at if you have a Bible. Isaiah 52, and I'm going to begin to read... At verse um, 13. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Many were astonished at him. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the sons of men. And he'll sprinkle many nations. Some versions have startle. The Hebrew word me either. 
He'll sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they'll see. That which they haven't heard, they'll understand. Now remember, chapter divisions are man-made. Isaiah didn't write 5, 3. So read on. Who has believed what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow up before him like a tender plant, like a root out of dry ground. But he has no form nor comeliness, no beauty that we should look at him, no beauty we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He is oppressed, afflicted, but he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. As for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? They made his grave with the wicked, with the rich man in his death, though he'd done no violence, no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When he makes himself an offering for sin, he'll see his offspring. Note, he's cut off, he's killed, cut off out of the land of the living. We read that in verse 8. But now he sees his offspring. He'll prolong his days. There it is in verse 10. And the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He'll see the fruit of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By knowledge of him shall my righteous servant make many to be accounted righteous and he'll bear their iniquities. Therefore I'll divide him a portion with the great and he'll divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death, was numbered with the transgressors, Yet he bore the sin of many. The Hebrew is the sin of the many. And made intercession for the transgressors. Father, forgive them. That amazing prophecy is written long, long before Bethlehem. It's found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which go back long, long before Christ came to the earth. No one can say, whatever their opinion is about when Isaiah was written, no one can deny this was written long, long before Christ came. And it's been the cause of the conversion of many atheists over the centuries. Because there you have a synopsis of Passion Week. It's historically correct, with the wicked as he's dying, the thieves, with a rich man his death and a rich man's tomb, making intercession for the transgressors, Father forgive them. It's doctrinally correct, all we like sheep have gone astray, we're sinners. But not him, he'd done no violence, neither was deceit found in his mouth. It used the language of the Old Testament sacrifices when you make his soul an offering for sin. See? Marvellous, marvellous chapter, worthy of our closest study. And I must tell you something about it that's very important. Everything of importance is disputed. If it's not disputed, it's probably not too important. And there's a lot of polemics in theology as there is in religion in general and politics and so on. This is so clear cut that for decades, Bible scholars, many of them are not Christians, you need to remember that. I've been to three universities. One of them, the head of the theology department, was a Buddhist. There are many Bible scholars that do it for a profession who are not born-again people, not committed to Christ. Many Bible scholars for decades try to say, oh, that can't be Christ. It's too obviously a prediction. And so they've come up with about 20 different people, like Jeremiah, 
and all sorts of other characters. But it won't fit any of them because you can't say about them that they've done nothing wrong and that though they were cut off, they would live again and so on. It just doesn't fit them. That they'd sprinkle many nations it doesn't fit. But some years ago, a great Hebrew scholar in England culminated 40 years of research on this chapter. 40 years, and wrote a book called, I think it's called The Suffering Servant. His name is North, N-O-R-T-H, in which he said, all the attempts to avoid this prophecy as applying to Jesus of Nazareth have all failed. And he listed all the previous opinions and how one after another they had been now thrown out as not fitting the text, not being accurate. So anyone who reads that text that knows the story of Passion Week can be absolutely sure that the Old Testament foresaw the coming and the death of our Saviour long before he came. Right, we have time for some questions. Yeah. But it also has another it's often used for gift. Mm-hmm. Gift. Often used for gift. It's Sometimes it's used for beauty. And enabling? Beg pardon? And enabling? Yes, but in the sense, I think, of God's gracious gift of strength. Yes. But in the context about soteriology, it has the meaning of forgiveness and acceptance. God loves the unlovely and that's the meaning of grace. God loves the unlovely. What do you mean by circumcision of the heart? The Old Testament talks about people's hearts being like stone. Stony hearts. And we know what that is. We use that analogy today. Someone who's hard-hearted. God says, when you come to know me, you'll be soft-hearted. Circumcision was a removal of flesh and it's using a metaphor, God will take away the hardness to give us a soft heart. Yeah. Please. Well, I must get a Schultz question. Go the ahead. The prophecy in Daniel about the 77. Yes. Would the Jews in the time of Christ yes. have applied that to the Messiah? They did indeed. Now, this reference is to Daniel 9, 24 to 27 where it talks about 70 weeks of years under Messiah the Prince who would be cut off and then the city would be destroyed. Remember it says in Mark 1.15 that when Christ came he said, the time is fulfilled. And you'll remember that in Luke's Gospel it talks about when he was presented, they spoke of him to those who looked for redemption in Israel. And probably behind the visit of the three wise men, was the fact that in synagogues all around the world, that prophecy was used to say, someone great is coming. This is documented in a number of books. One source I remember is a very old set of books called Thomas Hartwell Horne's Introduction to the Critical Study and Knowledge of the Holy Scriptures. That Just about the time Christ was coming, there was expectation in the whole ancient world, someone great was coming. And it was probably because of that prophecy being looked at in the synagogues all around the world. See, God was in the synagogue system. It meant the scriptures were scattered throughout the known world. And that was a very important book. The most influential book on the New Testament was the book of Daniel. All the themes that are prominent in Christ's eschatology, himself the Son of Man, comes from Daniel 7. The Kingdom of God, which occurs again and again, particularly in Matthew, comes from Daniel 2, about the Kingdom of Heaven. The judgment comes from Daniel 7. The judgment was set, the books were opened. The resurrection comes from Daniel 12. Many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. The Antichrist, abomination of desolation, the name for Antichrist, comes from Antichrist throughout the book of Daniel. It is the most influential book on the New Testament. Daniel, in its apocalyptic prophecies, has been called the mother of New Testament theology. 
Even the gospel justification is found in seed form in Daniel and we will look at that later. Any, any other questions? Please. Uh, why do you say that the past five months of conglomeration revelation is because people don't know anything about it or they're too scared to write on it or it's funny? Well, if you pick up a typical commentary like William Barclay, it'll say something like this. Nobody knows what it is. So... Uh, the vast majority of books written over the century have either settled, one, for the Roman banners invading Jerusalem in AD 70, but that's not held by most scholars today because this is a chapter that not only looks at AD 70, but looks at the end of the world. And the Greek implies Antichrist in this passage by a rearranging of subjects and predicate as regards gender in such a way that scholars now say it's obviously pointing to Antichrist. But if you look at the vast majority of commentaries say we don't know what it is or they'll settle for the old view, well, it's just the Roman banners. But it can't be just the Roman banners because this prophecy reoccurs in essence in 2 Thessalonians 2 and throughout the book of Revelation, particularly in chapters 17 to 19. And most scholars would put Revelation written long after the fall. Please. What conclusions do you come to? And why isn't the book still in the circulation? <laughs> in essence, in essence, Christ is predicting the final form of Antichrist in a disintegrating world when church and state will unite to try and cement a collapsing society. But I will talk a lot more about that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? Please. Is the Holy Spirit, how is it, his presence different with mankind? Ah, excellent question. The Holy Spirit has been here from the beginning of time, mentioned in the very first chapter of Scripture, moved upon men. But since the atonement has been completed, now he dwells in men. Old Testament, he'll speak about him clothing Gideon, clothing Samson, with men for a time to do a special work but never in the sense of the fullness of the New Testament. What will illustrate it is this. John the Baptist was declared to be the greatest of all men that had been born. Jesus said that. Among those born of women, never been a greater than John the Baptist. But do you remember what the next line is? The next line says, but he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Right, you and I are in the kingdom of heaven, the gospel era. But are we as great a man as John the Baptist? I certainly am not. So what did he mean? He meant privilege, privilege. That the privileges belonging to the gospel era are much greater than any that was known hitherto, even by the most wonderful of people like John the Baptist. Our privileges are greater. So Pentecost is the historical occasion when the fruit of the cross in the gift of the Spirit is manifest and in such a way that we would be taught that he's come to stay. The Holy Spirit's mentioned over 70 times in the book of Acts. 70 times. He's the one that woos our hearts. He's the one that comforts our hearts. He convicts us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And he's our teacher and he pleads with us. He is the living Christ invisible within every believer. That's an excellent question. We live in a greater age of privilege because the atonement's been fulfilled. Yes. Any other question? Please, Keith. Uh, isn't, isn't David a bit particular exception when you mentioned the, the, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Doesn't the Bible say that the Spirit of God was in him or something similar? It would say something similar. I doubt it says dwelt in him in a parallel sense, New Testament. But you're quite right, Keith in pointing out that the Old Testament elevates David. The two names most often found in the Old Testament are Moses and David, somewhere around a thousand times each. The only name that eclipses them is God, found 6,500 times. See? David is pictured as very privileged, but he's not pictured as having all the gifts, fruit of the Spirit, all those things that are now available since Pentecost. 
To study it further, Keith, you need to read 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 14 where the gifts of the Spirit are spelt out, which in ancient times existed in many quantities, but never to the same depth of privilege that it is now possible because the barrier between God and man, the barrier of unpaid for sins, has now been gotten rid of. That's the meaning of the cross. God has dealt with sin. It's finished. He's rolled it away. Therefore, he doesn't withhold anything now. Any other question? Please. Oh, yes. Yes, that's a good question. The cross casts its shadow backwards as well as forwards. That's why Christ is spoken of as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When you read Hebrews 11 about those who are going to be in the roll call of heaven and you get some surprises, like the mad playboy Samson's among them, but he went through in a conversion experience, remember, when his hair grew again. <clears throat> They're all only saved because of the blood of Christ. Though none of them knew anything to the degree that we know, they are saved by faith in a saviour to come. We by faith in a saviour that has come. Yes, thank you. That's an excellent question. Please. Um, talking before about some of those um, people that are talking about um, evolution in quantum. Yes. How much do you think um, a Christian can learn from the scientific um, versions of um, theories about the creation of the universe? Well, I'll give you an opinion, and the opinion is this. The Bible is very emphatic on who is behind creation, but not so emphatic about how. Science is very important. We all depending upon it all the time, every day, and science is self-correcting, but not always in a hurry. You know, they used to teach you about ether, something spread out everywhere, and you still find in all the old books, but there's no such thing. There were 500 PhD dissertations done on the Piltdown Man. Imagine it. 500 doctoral dissertations done on the Piltdown Man, and it was a fraud. It was a fraud. But we would be wrong if we discounted science because of that, because science is self-corrective. And if science can put a man on the moon, we need to be very careful in our criticisms of science. What we can say is that in the field of science, as in theology, or as in politics, or in any other area, fallibility is a constant threat, and nobody is infallible, but we must never make a blanket dismissal of something that can do the wonders that science does. I've done the equivalent of 40 times around the world in jet planes. I couldn't do it on a scooter. See? So it has its place, but I would prefer, if it was a book dealing with the philosophy of science, I would prefer to make sure I also read books on that topic from a Christian standpoint. One of the most well-known men in this area, and he lectured here in Brisbane a few years ago, is Polkinghorn, P-O-L-K-I-N-G-H-O-R-N-E. He's written several books. He was uh, the chief man in uh, mathematical physics, either Cambridge or Oxford, I'm not sure which. Uh, but, and I think his first name is John, John Polkinghorn. He has written several books, and they're fascinating. Not infallible, but fascinating. For example, I'll tell you one thing. It was a surprise to me. He pointed out that if two electrons are revolving around the same atom, they belong to the same atom, if you separate them, and if somehow you get one up in the Arctic Circle and the other one's kept in London in the laboratory, if you touch one of them, the other reacts just as though it had been touched. That's quite a shocker. Another thing Polkinghorne points out is that when a butterfly flaps its wings in the heart of Africa, that has something to do with the storms that come to London a few weeks later. Sir James Jean says, even if a baby throws its rattle out of the pram, 
it will disturb the motion of the furthest star. Now, that sounds terribly exaggerated to us, but there is a scientific basis for the fact there is some connection between everything in God's universe. So John Polkinghorne would be one man you may be interested on in that area. You've been a very patient group, and I'm so glad to have you here. The ninth is our next one. If you decide you want to register, Len can tell you how to do that. Uh, but let's close with a prayer, shall we? Lord, none of us know much, but we seek your spirit to be our teacher and help us to understand your book and help us see how practical it is that we don't walk alone and though we're stumbled, we're not rejected. That We're accepted in the beloved, we're complete in him and there's no condemnation to us who have received the gracious gift of Christ. Bless each one of us here and keep us for Christ's sake. Amen.